The King George V was created for a world where neither railways nor good blacksmiths need doubt that they were needed. In August 1927, the first of Swindon's new kings went to America for the Baltimore and Ohio exhibition. The visit was a huge success. Britain's engineering skills seemed confirmed beyond argument. Railway enthusiasts, of course, know all about that American triumph. That's one reason why they were getting wet on Easter Sunday. Whatever else the letters GWR evoke, they surely include some assurance about a past with values yet to be challenged, about craftsmanship, of machines made to last, and timetables not easily broken. An assurance that today's nostalgia is more than just a way of healing our memories. One other thing I discovered. Half the workforce at Swindon seemed either to have worked for the GWR or had a father who did. Great Western ancestry for some goes back even earlier than that. British Rail might reasonably protest that millions have been invested here, but a lot of equipment still had GWR stamped on it and there was still talk of working to GWR standards. Take the wheel shop. There are, of course, a lot of wheels on a train, and they all wear out. Railway wheels have tires, steel tires. Here they're replacing an old tire and fitting a new one. Heat the old one so that it expands, cool the rest of the wheel, and the tire comes off. Next, to fit a wheel with a new tyre that will also have cooked inside a gas ring for half an hour. No very great skill is involved, but the teamwork needs precision. Everyone must do his bit, spot on cue. It's hot and it's heavy. Similar teams have been doing much the same thing since Brunel's day. This wheel comes from a shunting locomotive. It must be set down in exactly the right place inside a new tire so hot that its inside diameter is just 3 sixteenths of an inch more than the outside of the wheel. There's a flange to prevent the tire from slipping. Afterwards, both will be left 16 hours to cool. In 1935, when the Great Western celebrated its centenary, the company chairman talked of team spirit. Brunel was, of course, remembered. The company seemed set for another hundred years. The Great Western Railway has preserved not only its name, but its innate spirit and conscientious outlook. It is gratifying to feel that this sentiment permeates the whole system and that all grades of the staff cherish it and take pride in the part which they play in this widespread organisation. It is this feeling of loyalty to our service, which is to us much less a machine and much more a living personality, that has earned the reputation which our railway enjoys today among the public. We, within our community, celebrate its hundredth birthday with affection and with an emotion charged with an ardent desire that it should flourish into far distant years, renewing its youth and its vigour at each successive stage of its progress. The end was nearer than he thought. In 1948, the GWR was nationalised.
Officially then, whether its spirit lived on or not, the GWR had been dead for 37 years when the 150th anniversary celebrations took place. It's one of the ironies of the 80s that they prompted more interest than the centenary of 1935. The magic of a big steam locomotive seems more potent than ever. We filmed for three days in May, not knowing that the following week British Rail Engineering would announce the closure of the Swindon Works by March 1986.